So today I'll be exploring East Kent as an overlay landscape, and in particular the part of East Kent where I live. The term overlay landscape is used as a term used by Alfred Kentigan Seavers to describe the kind of lens or window created by, for example, the Canterbury Tales or the Sosa Gawain and the Green Knight or the Fairy Queen, which allows one to experience an actual known terrain as an intricate fabric of interwoven spiritual, imaginative, and material realities. So walking in the world blessed with a, an overlay landscape is to engage in a personal, creative, and embodied relationship with it. Um, overlay landscape may in fact be arguably understood as an alternative word for map, or map as an alternative word for overlay landscape. Map, after all, derives from the classical Latin for tablecloth or napkin. A map is an overlay, in other words, something spread out by and through which one explores a landscape. Map. Um, the difference is probably one of emphasis rather than of opposition. An overlay landscape puts the stress on the visionary rather than the pragmatic. Uh, my particular overlay landscape has a very strong hauntological tint. Hauntology is an expression joined, uh, coined by Jacques Derrida, but, well, we need not let that deter us too much. It has, in any case, become, in the words of Melin Coverley, a peculiarly English phenomenon bound up with the haunting and haunted landscapes of the English countryside and the ambivalent response they continue to evoke. It has to do with the effective presence of an absence or the effective absence of a presence with the return of forgotten or half-forgotten apparitions, whether they be places, persons, ideas, or mindsets, so that occasionally the past may, may seem to blot out the present or to hover just to one side of it. In the words of Mark Fisher, it also has to do with the not yet, as much as the no longer. The landscapes of East Kent are haunted by lost futures, or the lost possibility of a future, as much as by ghosts of the past. So my hauntological overlay landscape um, is then one that does not quite, doesn't quite fit. It shows up the gaps. It's a superimposition gone wrong. Um, a badly inked four-colour comic or map. And the haunted landscape I habitually walk, or at least imagine, is a shallow valley which is generally marked by one very evidently present absence, that of its river. Excellent. That of its river, the mail bomb. The Nailbone is an intermittent chalk stream which appears at irregular intervals. And even when it does not run, it haunts the land and the imagination, as was experienced at a very young age by the visionary filmmaker Michael Powell, who we've already heard about today, who was born very close to its course in Beekstorm, as uh, Powell writes in his autobiography. Although the headwaters of our little river often failed, so that Patrick's born and Beekstorm Brook, so other names for the the Nailborn, so that Patrick's Bourne and Bigsborn Brook ran dry under their many rivers. I was informed by the gardener that the river was still there. See, Master Mick, how green the grass is in the bed of the brook. That's because the stream's there. He's sunk into the ground, but he's running down there in the chalk. The pal, he writes, is put in mind of the terrifying underground river in Allen Quartermain, or Elf, the sacred river which ran through caverns measureless to man. So the gardener's comments may be ge geologically inaccurate, but they do capture the numinosity of the nail born, which is somehow always there and not there at the same time, hidden in pitch black caves, caverns, underground tunnels, openly displayed by its absence. Even when it runs, this little river is not nowadays truly known So, the Melbourne running through 
the ford in Bridge, uh, Bridge where I live, small, small village. Um, even when it runs this little river, it's not really truly no known, not really that is perceived for, for what it is. A 15th century chronicle um, declares it to be one of the first, uh, one of the five traditional well waters of England whose flowing presages national disaster. At best, this is now regarded as a quaint piece of folklore, draining meaning out of the landscape, forcing the true mythopoetic presence of the river permanently underground, where its warnings cannot be divined. F.C. Snell, who's writing in the 30s, is typical of his loft, uh, in his lofty dismissal of what was once common knowledge, Snell writes, to hold that their coming presage all sorts of national and political calamities, dearth and famine, is to stretch the imagination to the point that, uh, to the point that may have been possible in the darker ages of the past, but which is too much to expect today. Writing in 1938, however, and surveying the unusual frequency of the stream's flow, he does add, certainly in these days, especially since 1910, when there have been many annual appearances of the streams, there have been abundant calamities that if we felt so inclined, we might well have connected with the frequent appearance of these innocent and natural effects of the na nail bomb. So always there, but now never really seen. These apparitions nevertheless niggle and worry. What if they could bode ill? What if these putatively darker ages of superstition and ignorance actually perceived more than the ages of reason, the eyes of reason, the possibilities haunt. In the meantime, the nail bomb has been flowing for some time, a year or so now, unseen and unheeded by most. It's at best a spectral presence, its own ghost. The future that it warns of, once present to the understanding eyes of locals, is now lost underground still there, but unacknowledged. Haunted by its own river, the valley and its environs are marked out by folklore as a place where the ghosts of past and future national losses may be glimpsed. Above the river, just outside the village where I live, Bridge, is the almost perfectly round hollow known as Old England's Hole in that PowerPoint slide. It's the that um, it's shown in the, the lower the photograph on that old postcard. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, almost perfectly round hollow known as Old England's Hole. This is where, so local folklore tells us, local tribes put up a literally last ditch attempt to halt the incursion of Caesar and his army. The so Old England's Hole is thus associated with the romance of lost causes, the dream of what was lost when the Romans came, a Celtic dream tinged with druidic mists and enchanted by spells, the longing felt by many in Britain and indeed elsewhere for the imagined past. A fairy, the green man, seasonal celebrations at Avalon begins on the slope of Bridge Hill. Old England's hole is haunted by the yearning of no longer and the bitter promise of not yet. It is a local and national version of the loss of Eden, the once and future loss which holds within it all losses. Adam and Eve's eating of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil does indeed grant them knowledge, but not that which they had hoped for. What they instead gain is the hauntological knowledge par excellence that they will always be haunted by their lost past and their lost future. As St. Isaac the Syrian wrote in his great 4th century poem, Hymns on Paradise. God established the tree as judge, so that if Adam should eat from it, it might show him that rank which he had lost through his pride, and show him as well that low estate he had acquired to his torment. Now, S.C. Snell may have dismissed this, this story, in the same way that he rejected the story of the nail-born. Many people would probably concur. Yet a, loss, a past lost and a future denied continue to haunt many. Literature describes the land of the nail-born, to return to the nail-born, as haunted by these losses, beginning with the great national loss 
of low grace. That was the enchanted realm of the Arthurian romances in the British Golden Age. Thomas Mallory in the 15th century, as Arthur's very, uh, first battles against his nemesis Mordred take place at Dover, and then on Barham Downs, overlooking the Woe Waters, overlooking the Nailbourne. Mallory does not record whether, uh, whether they were flowing on that day, but they surely must have been, for Arthur's victory is short-lived, and the final battle will come before long, bringing the death of the Rex Quondam, Rex Quae Futurus, and the destruction of his kingdom. Logras remains spectrally present, this, this lost kingdom of Camelot and Arthur, spectrally present, however, a vision that haunts the land and gives the lie to modernity. In his novel, That Hideous Strength, for example, C.S. Lewis has the character Mother Dimble explain how something we may call Britain is always haunted by something we may call Logras. Have you noticed that there are two countries after every Arthur a Mordred, after every Milton, a Cromwell, a nation of poets, a nation of shopkeepers, the home of Sydney and of Cecil Rhodes. Interesting choice. This hauntingly absent presence, Logras, begins on barren downs above the Melbourne, where it, where it always began and will always have begun. Another traditional title. Another traditional title of what's been lost is Albion, the oldest recorded name for the islands now known as Great Britain. Uh, readers of Blake know that Albion is the visionary pitfall of the country, asleep now, held captive by small-minded lack of imagination and literalistic materialism. Lewis's Mordred, shopkeepers, or Cecil Rhodes, robbers of his future reappearance, and with it the transfiguration of Britain this lost future, this not yet, haunts the heart with its effective absence. As Geoffrey Ash writes in Camelot and the Vision of Albion, the visionary kingdom is still invisibly there, latent. There is, he says, a haunting sense that something of sovereign and magical importance is lost yet not lost, and he writes that with hyphens, lost yet not lost. This begins, I'm arguing, by the nail born, Arthur, Albion, Logras, asleep in the caverns where the woe waters run invisibly. The 20th century writer and botanist Jocelyn Brook, long, term, uh, long time observer of the nail bomb, picks up on this, albeit in a minor and rather ironic key. Bishopsbourne, the, uh, the village lapped by the woe waters of the nail bomb, where he spent many years, was for him a very English and very middle class Garden of Eden, the symbol of a happiness when he was a child which promised to return every summer. Yet to his childhood imagination, this summer land was always already blasted by the hellish invisible absence of subterranean, excuse me, or um, invisible presence of subterranean caves, hollowing out the whole of the land of the Nailborn. These are inhabited not by Arthur or Albion, but subhuman creatures who he imagines bursting out into the open at any moment, wrecking paradise banishing it forever, or leaving it a gossamer thin presence. In Brooks' adult version of this local overlay landscape, there lies not far from Bishop's spawn something that he calls an ill-defined, uncharted kingdom. It is, he writes, a remote and potentially hostile territory, only to be approached at one's peril and at the cost of unimaginable ardours and endurance. At its centre is a place which is not a place, an absent present or present absence with the name of Clamber Crown. <clears throat> Whether or not it was uncharted in Brooks time, I cannot say, but it's to be found on maps now. Should one visit it, however, one quickly, quickly establishes that it's hardly there at all or not at all. There's no sign with a place name and no settlement. Only a house, single and alone, which itself marks the absence of what it was decades ago, a pub, a pub called The Dog. Brooke gave a 1955 work the title The Dog at Clamber Crown, naming it after a double absence. It tells of his attempts to visit this place of losses. 
in his novel, The Image of a Drawn Sword, this non-pub, the dog, and the absent place, Clamber Crown, become the advanced headquarters for invading enemy forces. The dog at Clamber Crown is thus the centre from which World War III spreads into Britain. The whole country becomes Clamber Crown, a name which marks only a haunting absence, a future lost, submerged by the woe waters, but returning with them forever, until in Russell Hoban's Ridley Walker, which we've already heard Peter mention, even this small stream, the Melbourne, loses its name in a post-apocalyptic, uh, post-nuclear apocalypse, and the Melbourne finally degenerates into Nellie's bum. Uh, perhaps it should also be called Old England's Hole. These apocalyptic future losses have already happened and already always happened in East Kent. They return again and again, ghosts of the past and ghosts of the future. What returns and will return may be the beautiful dream of Logras, or it may be a much more ancient nightmare of blood and violence, held fast as it were in the old stones themselves, as one of British hauntology's founding texts tells us can happen. In Nigel Neal's 1972 television play, The Stone Tape, an ancient wall has somehow recorded all the traumatic events which took place um, in its presence, paying them back to those who are sensitive to these things. The terrors go back to a time when the stones were part of a megalithic stone circle, and there's the suggestion that they attract future traumas, trapping the future in the past. Jocelyn Brooks world too, a work is also haunted by Neolithic monuments which suck into them all time so that the present is a repetition of the future and of the past. In The Scapegoat, which was uh, published in 1948, a dolmen stands in a field above the Nailbourne, above the Woe Waters, the old Druid stones, as well, one character calls them. These stones, the dolmen, repel the, the protagonist, a boy called Duncan, but he returns again and again to what he calls this bad place, until, with sickening inevitability, He's beaten to death while lying on the capstone, another sacrifice, predestined and foreknown. Somehow ancient sacrifices continue to be renewed in this ghostly part of the world. In David Hewson's Native Rites, published in 2000, a remote village in the hills above Wye, near the agricultural college, still practices human sacrifice at the annual Burning Man festivities. This is folk horror, a hauntological sub-branch preoccupied with pagan re-eruptions re in rural England as if the old religion is held in potential in the soil like trauma in a stone. Hewson's reference is, of course, uh, Robin Hardy's The Wicker Man, a film from 1973, um, but he's weaving the same overlay landscape as Brook, and there are more hints here that Eden has been lost in this part of Kent. The village above Y is called Beulah, which, as one character usefully explains, means, I'm quoting, married to God, favoured and blessed. It means a kind of paradise on earth. That future has been lost. It still haunts, just visible, behind the pagan revenants. Here the future has always been about to be lost, always will have to be. Every time one watches James Bond only just save the world from certain destruction, the ghostly outline of East Kent may be seen. For Ian Fleming's original was not only brought up at Pet's Bottom, in the valley parallel to that of the Nailbourne, quite close to the village where I live, but the spy battles Goldfinger or Drax not on tropical islands, but in Reculver, in Kingsdown. Bond, the agent of a powerful colonial past, which no longer exists, has repeatedly to save us from annihilation, which returns again and again and again. But Bond is no King Arthur, and the Secret Service, Service is no Camelot, and the future has always been lost. Those haunted land of the Nailbourne know this, and while that knowledge may not 
And while that knowledge may not seem much, the fate of the country depends on it, will indeed always have depended on it. Thank you. Well, thank you. I realized the one thing that we